Hello and welcome to the Classics Book Club. This is a place to come and delve into all those classics you always wanted to read. Today we'll be chatting about one of the all-time classics, Emma by Jane Austen. I'd like to firstly welcome Susanna Fullerton as our resident Queen of the Classics. Susanna has been President of the Jane Austen Society of Australia for the past 19 years and she's also patron of the Kipling Society of Australia, a founding member of the New South Wales Dickens Society and of the, of the Australian Bronte Association and a member of the Dylan Thomas Society of Australia. Susanna is Sydney's best known lecturer on classic novels and she lectures regularly at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Welcome Susanna. Hi. I'd also like to welcome Book Club member Sarah Burns, President of the Bronte Society. And Louise Owens, who is the author of the Book Lovers blog of choice, readmeblogsite.net. And of course, we'd also like to welcome back all our Book Club members watching our Hangout on Air. And don't forget to pop your questions into the comments and we'll do our best to get to them during the Hangout. And now to the book. Our heroine, Emma Woodhouse, feels a little lost after her governess marries and leaves the family home. She decides to take on a project by the name of Harriet Smith. Even though Emma's determined never to marry herself, she immediately decides to find Harriet a husband. She convinces Harriet to dump Robert Martin, the young farmer who likes her, and sets her sights on the town's clergyman, Mr Elton. Unfortunately, Mr Elton turns out to be in love with Emma. And when the dashing Frank Churchill comes to town, Emma tries very hard to fall in love with him herself. After much flirting and carrying on, she decides that Frank might just be the perfect new man for Harriet. Emma's exploits are watched and commented upon by her good friend, Mr Knightley, and although Emma frequently ignores his advice, she cherishes his good opinion. And when Mr Knightley accuses her of belittling her poor neighbours, Emma begins to reflect upon her mistakes and even starts to change her ways a little. The chaos of Emma's meddling ensues and Harriet confesses that she loves Mr Knightley not Frank, and all of a sudden Emma's plans crumble and she realises that she loves Mr Knightley too. Convinced that Mr Knightley might be interested in Harriet despite the fact that he practically lives with the Woodhouses, Emma crushes Mr Knightley's attempts to propose to her. But eventually all romantic models are cleared. Emma marries Mr Knightley and Harriet marries her farmer, Robert Martin, and the worlds are restored to order. <laughs> I hope I've given the book a decent summary. <laughs> Susanna, tell us more about this wonderful book. Well, it was 200 years ago in December 1815 that the world became a better place in which to live because <laughs> Emma was published. If you're lucky enough to own a first edition of Emma, you'll actually find that you don't have 1815 written on the title page. You have 1816. Uh, it was a custom in those days that if a book came out in the last month of the year, they actually put the following year's date into the front of the book. So don't look at 1816 and think, oh, you know, Susanna's wrong, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, it did actually appear in the world in December 1815, but it has 1816 on the front page. Uh, to me, Emma is the greatest novel of all time. I think it's the perfect book. I worship it and there's no lesser word to describe the way I feel about this wonderful novel. But it is very, very definitely a book you have to reread. You can't read Emma once and judge it. And most people who do don't tend to like the heroine very much or they don't find it a particularly good novel. This is a book of so much complexity, so much subtlety, so much amazing development of the heroine who learns as she progresses through the story that you absolutely have to read it and reread it and reread it and reread it. And no matter how many times I read Emma, I am still learning about the book. I come to love it even more, although I didn't think it was possible, with every rereading. Uh, and as I say, I think it is the perfect novel. But not everybody agrees with me. So let's start off by talking about this very controversial heroine, Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever and rich. Uh, many readers dislike Emma. And Jane Austen herself said she was going to create a heroine whom no one but herself would much like. 
So to start off with, how did you all respond to Emma Woodhouse as a heroine? Did you like her? Loathe her? Love her? How, were you, how did you respond to Emma? Letitia, you go first. Look, I don't like Emma at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the, I'm that kind. I um, I guess I I when I read it, you know, I, I thought, oh my god, what would it be like to have a friend like this? You just <laughs> want to run, and um, and I guess I was seeing it from from that sort of perspective. As a character, she's beautifully written, and and I love the book, so it's not in uh, about you know hating the book. It's just her as a as a character, she's just so much trouble, and she causes such horror in people's lives. <laughs> but, but luckily, I love that that you know, as you say, she's she's not vindictive, she's not horrid. You know, she does these things because she's not even thinking, and she it actually all comes from a good place in in some ways. So, I, d I don't think she's a horrible character. Um, but Does she really cause horror in people's lives. I mean, Mr. Knightley says to her at the end, she's actually improved Harriet, and she's you know meant that she saved Harriet from from uh, Robert uh, Mr. Elton. Mm -hmm. And has she actually caused any harm in the novel? And she's a wonderful daughter to her father. She is. I'm going to defend Emma. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sarah, what do you think of Emma? Well, I think Letitia hit the nail on the head with the, she doesn't think. Um, I think she's quite naive, actually. You know, the world centers around her. I mean, even when they're trying to break the, I don't know why it all had to be a secret, Frank and Jane, until Emma knew. And it had to be, it was a, his, his father couldn't tell her. The ex-governor had, the governors had to tell her. And it's around her, and she's used to that. So it's when things are happening that she can't control, that's when I think she starts to grow. Yeah. Because yeah. she she comes across adversity and, and things. I don't think she's horrible or what. I just, she doesn't think. Because she's never had to. It's all been easy for her. Yeah. She's 20 years old, and she's led an incredibly sheltered existence where she's top dog in her village. So it's no wonder she's... You know, a bit self-centered, a bit, a bit bossy, a bit, you know, managing of other people's lives. Uh, when you think what what her life is like as a as a character, as a young woman, uh, she's never even seen the sea. She no. lives in Surrey. The sea is not very far away. Emma's had such a restricted life that I think she and she's got a good brain. She's just bored. She's mm. desperately bored. So Louise, what do you think of her? I thought it was a really interesting device of Jane Austen's to have to introduce us to a, that who was going to be the heroine, somebody that we really couldn't like. We couldn't have a hook. We couldn't. There's nothing that we could really like about her. And I think um, often the heroine or the hero is somebody that you've got some empathy with, and you kind of go along with the journey, and you can empathise with them, and you can feel how they're feeling. But I thought that was a really interesting device. It really threw me. I thought, oh, but, but I'm supposed to like her, and I really, really don't. Um, but of course you do grow with her. I think you must all be much better people than I am because I feel <laughs> such empathy with Emma. <laughs> you know, don't you all say things and then think, oh God, I shouldn't have said oh. that. If only I could take that back just as Emma does with Miss Bates. Don't yeah. you all, you know, make little arrangements and then think, oh dear, I shouldn't have done that. That wasn't a very good idea. I think Emma's so wonderfully human, and I relate to her more than I do to any of Jane Austen's other heroines. So I'm a bit worried now. I think, oh dear, am I? Am I really? No, I think you're totally right. You know, I think that's that's what makes her so interesting. But sometimes, personally, I like to escape. You know, in books, and she's too human. And so, <laughs> okay. you know, I want my heroines to be, you know, yeah, very different. But I think. I think you're right, and I think what I always forget with Emma, and you're right, when you reread and keep rereading it, you, it's reinforced that she's so young. And mm. I remember being that arrogant, you know, when I was so young, and, and thinking that I was right about everything, and I was right about people. And so I think if you remember that, then then her character takes on such a different um, mm. personality in some ways. Yeah. Now, what about our hero, Mr. Knightley? He's 16 years older. 
When I first read Emma, I thought Mr. Knightley was so old. He was in his <laughs> 30s. He was ancient. How could any girl fall in love with Mr. Knightley? Now I'm deeply in love with Mr. Knightley, even though I'm probably old enough to be his mother, which is a very depressing thought. <laughs> and uh, I think he's a wonderful, wonderful hero in this novel. But um, you know, he's not as instantly lovable as, as perhaps Mr. Darcy, or he's less of the sort of romantic hero that Mr. Darcy is. So how does Mr. Knightley rank in your lists of uh, Jane Austen heroes? Hmm. <laughs> Quite highly, I think. I, I, he's, I think he's a good man, and he's very fair, and he's obviously very fond of Emma, and he's always in her house almost, you know, they're part of the family, but um, she, he's always there. Mm. And uh, I, I think he's a, he's a good man, you know, he's obviously a good uh, landlord to his tenants, the tenant farmers and his neighbours, so I'm very fond of him. <laughs> I think it's interesting with this particular um, man, she didn't make him... Um, like he wasn't someone that she that she had to oppose in any in, in any real way, in the same way that, you know, like Darcy and Elizabeth and those sort of, you know, tension sort of relationships that resolve. Um, in some ways he's always just behind her and I could yeah. just I could see, you know, a smile on his face all the time watching these machinations happen and, and watching yeah. sort of go through the world. So I kind of like that about him in some ways. Yeah. And what's so fascinating with a, a rereading of the novel is that you discover how how he is always first in Emma's thoughts. Even at moments when she sort of almost smacks herself on the head and says, you know, here I go, thinking of Frank Churchill first again, you examine those pieces carefully and you discover that no, it's always Mr. Knightley that she thinks of first. What did you think of him, Louise? Yeah, I thought he was just this loyal person um, in the background and I was so surprised that he was the hero in the end, because I just I didn't see that coming at all. But I, I, I liked him. I thought you know the loyalty, the steadiness. Um, he was just always there. But yeah, no, he had to be a little bit lower than um, um, on the Mr. Darcy rail. Right. Yeah. Right but up. when you reread, you see all the clues that Jane Austen yeah. gives us. And, and all audio books too. Listen. Oh. listen. Yes. Yeah. Fabulous to listen to them well read on audio. There's that gorgeous moment at the ball when he says to Emma, who are you going to dance with? And Emma's very cheeky and she says, with you, if you will ask <laughs> Tonight he says, you know, that he's only too happy to ask him. He says, after all, we're not so much brother and sister as to make it at all improper. Sorry, Emma says that to him. And Mr Knightley says, brother and sister, no indeed. <laughs> oh, that sends kind of shivers through me. <laughs> Wonderful moment. <laughs> As we're talking, I've just had um, a vision of John Thornton and that wonderful scene in in North and South where he's he know he's not talking to Margaret. He's not hasn't even acknowledged her, but he knows exactly where she is, what she's doing. You know, and I think Mr. Knightley's a bit like that. He's always aware of her. He's all he doesn't need to be in her presence or right. You know, with her, but he knows mm. what's going on, and mm. she's aware of him. And yeah. she's he's looking out for her as well. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the really great aspects of Emma as a novel is the creation of the town of Highbury. Uh, Highbury becomes so real to us as a setting of the novel that we almost feel that we ourselves are popping into Ford's to buy gloves or going to Mrs. Wallace the baker or you know seeing Mr. Cox the lawyer uh, going on his horse up the street. I think Jane Austen more than in any of her other novels creates a, a sense of place and of community quite brilliantly in, uh, in, in Highbury and Emma. So some of the characters that people this village, do, do you have some favourites from the novel? Uh, we all love to hate the Iltons, and uh, how do you respond to Harriet? Do you have characters apart from the hero and the heroine who are particular favourites as you read the book? I do have a um, a bit of a soft spot for Miss Bates. Mrs. Bates. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I think that she plays such a crucial role. She's a, she's a bit like um, a Shakespearean fool in a way that you know she reveals the truth. Um, 
to many of the characters and I think um, her speeches are just amazing and if you can read them aloud or as you read them in your head, it just um, you're kind of laughing and you're crying and you're um, you're in horror, the whole gambit of, um, of emotions. I, I find her an intriguing but a really crucial character. She's, yeah, you're right. She, she knows what's happening in the novel. Mm. Miss Bates really functions like the Bush Telegraph. You know, she lets out so much of what's going on in Highbury. Uh, get the audio version read by Prunella Scales, and the way she does those speeches of Miss Bates is sheer brilliance. <laughs> Now, none of us would want to be in a room with Miss Bates. You'd, you'd run screaming, you'd go nuts. But to read those great speeches and to know that Jane Austen must have known a woman that talked too much yeah. and captures that so superbly with Miss Bates. So the speeches are a joy to read and yet at the same time they give you the horrors at the thought of being with a woman that talks as much as Miss Bates. It's Brilliance, absolute genius on, on the part of Jane Austen, in my view. <laughs> Sarah, do, have you got favourite Highbury characters that you love? I don't know about the favourite, but I mean, I like Robert Martin. They're just they're all the minor. So we've got Mr. and Mrs. Weston, um, Frank Churchill, and the, the presence of Mrs. Churchill, even though she's not really in it, but she's looming over everybody. All, all the, the little people who are just the pieces of the puzzle and they've all got important roles. I mean obviously Mrs. Weston uh, being Emma's governess has a big role mm. to play uh, in almost sobering her. She and, and Mrs. Knightley are the ones that really direct Emma, Emma as, a, as a person. Yeah, yeah. And What's so interesting is that characters like Mrs. Churchill, who you mentioned, never actually say a word in the novel. Uh, Mr. Perry never gets a line of speech. We just get his reported speech through the mouth of Mr. Woodhouse and we don't know how that's been distorted. So all these characters who don't really ever appear on stage but are so much a part of the Highbury world. Letitia, have you got a favourite uh, Highbury character or poem? or? <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do like Harriet um, as a character. Like she's just, and so obviously so pivotal to the story. But um, just such the antithesis of Emma, you know. This, and and so I, I love how they play off each other. And I think some of the, my favourite moments in the book are those two sort of <laughs> going on their adventures, their romantic adventures together. Um, so I, I do, I do love Harriet as as a character. And Harriet's stupidity, of course, yeah. showing up in this book, right? <laughs> Yeah. Now, uh, this is also an incredibly funny novel. You laugh out loud as you read it. The, the humour is wonderful. And some of the great humour comes from Mr. and Mrs. Elton. Uh, Mr. Elton's proposal when poor Emma is trapped in the carriage. Uh, that incredible moment when poor Mr. Elton is in the room with the woman he had just married the woman he had wanted to marry and the woman he had been expected to marry. <laughs> he says the poor man has some right to look a little foolish in the circumstances. Great. So do the Eltons do any harm in this novel or are they only there for comic purposes? Harm is a harsh word to use. I don't think any any of them cause harm. I think Mrs. Elton brings a bit of freshness and uh, it's almost like new blood into it and makes them think about other things and exposes them to um, the way others live, like Mr. Suckling. Uh, I don't think they're harmful. I just think they, they, they're good catalysts to the plot. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point, yeah. Yeah, but great humour. Throws them up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I love Mrs. Elton and her. But what is it about her barouche? The, the barouche, barouche Londo, and her Caro Sposa. She keeps oh, no. the Italian grammar wrong, and she can't get the Caro and the Sposo to agree. So she either says Cara Sposo or Caro Sposa, and she never gets it right anywhere in the book. <laughs> and as you say, the. Well, she does actually stir things up. Sorry? She stirs things up in a way that 
they're all activated in her presence. Yeah. You know, with the trip to um, Box Hill and the strawberry picking. Strawberry. It wouldn't have happened maybe without her. Yeah. Mm. So she does get them moving. <laughs> she does, yeah. And do you think that perhaps Mrs. Elton is a, a symbol in the novel of what Emma herself could become? That's if a really good point. If yeah. those characteristics get developed, if Mr. Knightley is, say Mr. Knightley did marry Harriet and took her off to Donwell and was no longer there for Emma, could Emma become like Mrs. Elton one day? Um, and I think that's one of the reasons she's in Very the book. Yeah. That's really, yeah, I never thought of that. That's really a great point. And we haven't really discussed Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill because this, of course, is a novel with two love stories. Uh, do you like Jane and Frank? Are you moved by their romance or is it a distraction from the main romance? Yeah, I thought it was, every time I read it, I was like, okay, 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 I just want to get back to the other guys. <laughs> so I, not, not that I didn't enjoy it, but um, yeah, it, it just seemed so apart sort of from everything else. But you do look for clues every yeah. time you reread it. You start looking for clues I, and listening to it, as I have just done recently on the audio, I think, oh, I'd forgotten that. Or they're just little things like, why is Jane walking out on the fields on her own and Emma feels necessary to send an arrow route <laughs> you know, because she's not right. Um, there's lots of clues that we miss. Oh, and Frank was actually very naughty to... Um, flirt with Emma and yeah. it, that made he, her feel very foolish when it all came out. Yeah. Yeah. Frank behaves very badly. Yeah. Does does Frank deserve Jane Fairfax? Uh, that's one of the questions you have to ask at the end of the novel. There's uh, a very clever line. He says that in the book it says that um, I think it's Emma says he brings the fortune, she'll have the merit. Yes. Yeah. No. So they're not equal. No. He's got the money and I think... Mm. The, the, it has been suggested that Jane Fairfax is one of the first portrayals in literature of somebody suffering from anorexia, which can comment. Uh, maybe not right, but, but certainly her depression affects her appetite and, and is she using eating as a form of control? It's, it's something interesting to speculate on. Now, there have been several film versions of Emma and very, very different film versions over the years. There's the Gwyneth Paltrow Emma, there's the Kate Beckinsale Emma, there's the Romola Garay Emma, there's an old BBC one with an actress called Doran God Godwin, I think it is. Uh, do you have a favourite film version of this wonderful novel? My, my pick would be um, Kate Beckinsale. Um, I, think she's, I think she's great as Emma. I don't know whether all the other characters are quite what I imagined in my head, but um, I do quite like um, the Kate Be Beckinsale version, I think, I think it's great. I think she's too bitchy as Emma, I don't think she has enough charm to be Emma, but <laughs> that's my view. <laughs> what about you Sarah, have you got a favourite? I think Romola Gara, I, I think she's she's lovely, and Gwyneth Paltrow, and I think that was beautifully filmed, mm, but just they they all irritated me except Jeremy Northam who's just yummy but yeah. they all just irritated <laughs> and Tony Collette I thought was awful but then I've seen other versions I think in the um, the Kate Beckinsale one the Harriet Smith character is it wasn't very likable either so there's it's hard to, to say but I think Rama Lagara version what about you Letitia I Okay, I didn't think it was the best overall, but my favourite Emma would have to be Gwyneth Paltrow. Mm. Yeah, she had a lot of charm as Emma. Yeah, I, I think there was a lot of bits about the the you know full film that you could pick holes in, but but I did like her as the best Emma, and I think she played her with that mischievous kind of yeah. um, you know glint in her eye that that I always imagined Emma to have. Mm. I still well, think that um, Emma Watson could do a good. Emma. <laughs> well, I th look, I think they'll keep making film versions. It's such yeah. a great story and they will just keep making film versions. So for me, the best version is the one in here, in my imagination. They're <laughs> absolutely perfect. But um, that's, 
they, they will keep making new film versions of Emma. So to, to round off our discussion, do any of you agree with me that this is the greatest novel the world has ever known? Which do you think can rival Emma in greatness or, or beat Emma? Diana, Great Expectations, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. <laughs> 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 but, 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 I do love it and I think you're so right. It's so amazingly written. Like, it's just a treasure to read over and over again. And I think that's what the makes it such a brilliant book. Yeah, rereading it, you become fonder and fonder. You yeah. do. Yeah. You have to reread Emma, so just go away and discover total perfection. <laughs> then you'll all agree with me. Emma is perfect. <laughs> I think. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> I think uh, we we all certainly agree with Susanna that this is definitely one of the classic books that you have to keep rereading to enjoy. So thank you so much, book clubbers, for a great discussion today on Emma, the greatest book ever written. <laughs> I'm quite Susanna Pullen. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for our Classic Book Club today. We'll be announcing our new dates shortly, so keep an eye out on Susanna's Google Plus page. Um, and we can't wait to bring you the next classic novel. Good night, everyone.